Hello everyone, it's Sheree from Rebel Technology and we are finally back with the second episode of PGL Tutorial. So I'm really sorry for taking ages, I moved house and uh, got busy and things get really crazy and just never had chance to find time but I'm back so let's get down to business. From where we left off from previous tutorial where we made the live looper with pitch shifting which is fun and games but it doesn't sync to anything really it's quite limited for a musical use. So on this episode, what we're going to do is we're going to add a time-synced loop length control. So this way the FX syncs to the clock and you can glitch it up, which is more fun. And we're going to figure out how to independently control the loop length and the pitch of the grains that you're looping. So what we're going to do first is to go back to the original PGL gem patch. And if you remember it from our gen delay patch tutorial, uh, we've made the tap tempo, which is this gen timer, and it counts the clock length and spits out the value in samples. So what we're going to do is take those two objects, copy it and paste it onto the tutorial patch and then connect the outlet of the param push and then bring it all closer. So in a bit, we're just going to make a little bit more space down there. But before we do that, uh, let's see what the phasers are doing right now. So it's outputting the value between 0 and 1 and then it's going into the inlet of the sample which is basically in charge of playing back what's on the buffer. So at the moment the phaser is outputting value between 0 and 1 so it's basically telling sample to play the entire content of the buffer from 0 to the end of the buffer. So what we're going to do is shorten that value so it plays from the beginning of the buffer, goes up to the certain index of that buffer and then loops back, hence creating a loop which we call it a grain. So we're going to grab these objects and push it all the way down so we have a little bit more of a working space because we'll be adding loads of objects in between the phaser and the sample. But before we do this, let's go back to the original patch and look at the pitch control, which is a bit different from what we have in a tutorial patch. So the original patch has a little bit fancier math and what it's doing is it's basically converting the pitch information to the sufficient uh, frequency information that phaser understands. So instead of feeding phaser the arbitrary pitch information, it's telling the phaser when the knob is completely anti-clockwise, the playback is octave lower, and then when it's clockwise, it's octave higher. So let's get rid of these two objects, and let's put the proper algorithm for the phaser to understand. So the first thing to do is to scale the value between 0 and 1 into 0 0.5 and 2. So this way, when the knob is 12 o'clock, it plays back on the original pitch. When it is on anti-clockwise, it plays on the half of the pitch, and then clockwise, double the pitch. And we divide 1 with that value which gives us the frequency yeah sorry about the typo uh, suddenly my keyboard switched back to Japanese so I'm just trying to fix this uh, I'll be there in a second and here we go so we connect the outlet of scale into the inverted divide and then out and the outlet of divide goes into the 
frequency input to the phaser. And then before we connect the param into the scale, we're going to add another inverted subtraction object between the param A and the scale. I'm doing this because when you connect the param A directly now, the anti-clockwise value will be the pitch high and then clockwise will go into the pitch low. So by adding one minus object, we can keep the physical position of the knob corresponding to pitch low and pitch high. So let's get into the nitty gritty. So the first thing to do is to look at the original patch and uh, we just look at this little section here. And it does look a little bit scary at the moment, but don't worry about it because uh, we're going to break it down to much smaller chunks and I'm going to explain how to make it simplified. So amongst all the fancy objects in there, the core thing to look at is that modulo object. And the modulo object is a great object when you're doing looping because what it does is you set the value for the modulo and whatever the value you feed in, it will loop between zero and that set value. You type in as an attribute or the right inlet will define that attribute. So let's get back into the tutorial patch and I'm gonna delete this connector. And then I'm gonna insert a new object by shift N and then type in modulo, which is percent, and then take the outlet, connect it to the first inlet of the second sample, which is your second channel, since we're working on a stereo. You can have two modulos and then control the loop length independently, but for this tutorial, we just keep things a bit simpler. So what we are doing now is to keep the loop length in sync with the clock input that pushes receiving. And since that gen timer abstraction is already giving us the length in sample, what we're going to do is we're going to fetch that data and then do a little bit of math, divide that tempo information to relative division of the master tempo that pushes receiving. So the first thing is to create a receive object with the same name, time. So we can fetch that value and then move it a bit closer and then let's grab the param c object drag it down so it's much closer to where we got and then the next thing to do is to multiply it by the maximum divisions that you want to go in this case i chose 16 so type in star which is the multiply and then follow by 16. Connect the output of param C and then add another divide object and then connect the output of the receive into the first scene letter of divide. And before you connect the output of the multiply, what we need to do is we have to keep the output value as an integer so the loop length value stays the relative division of the master tempo. To do this, we add the seal object, which basically rounds up to the higher integer. And that's a key thing. So what we need to do is connect the outlet of the multiply to the seal and then seal to the second inlet of the division and then change the minimum value of param c to 0 0.01. So what it does now is when the knob c is in fully anti-clock position, uh, the seal will round up the value to 1. So you never divide the tempo value with 0. Because in computing, dividing the value with zero is a really bad thing. And before we put that into the inlet of the modulo, we do one more math. Because at the moment, the value that comes out is way beyond one. 
and we cannot exceed one. So what we're going to do is we divide by the length of the buffer. And that keeps all the value neatly between 0 and 1. And let's save this patch quickly. And we're going to test what we've done. So we're going to go back to the parent patch. And then I'm going to close the max window. And then turn the DSP on. And what I'm going to do is tap the tempo. So now we have the pitch control and the loop length control, which is really good fun. But one thing we notice is when you change the pitch control, it actually affects the length of the loop. And the original version of the PGL, I left out this issue because I thought it was good fun. But I realized after playing it around for a while, I realized it's probably be better off if you make the pitch and the loop length independent. So the way to do this, let's move the parent window down. It's really simple. So if you look on the original one, it's just the, what it does is you basically multiply the pitch information into the length of the loop. And by doing that, you are basically compensating for the change of the speed of the playback. So when the pitch is twice as high, the playback is twice as fast. So if you double the distance that it travels, it won't affect the loop length. And when the playback speed is halved, you halve the distance it travels. So hence, again, you won't affect the length of the loop. So let's create another send object and then call it pitch. Then connect the outlet and then create the receive object. And then call it a same name, which is pitch and you add another multiple object. And then connect the outlet of the receive into the right inlet of the multiply. And make it a little bit neater, like so. And let's go back to the parent patch. Turn the DSP on, tap tempo. So now you can hear the pitch is independent from the loop length. So before we wrap this up, we're going to add just a one more little thing. And that's just to basically up the quality of the grain looping. And it's called windowing. And if you're not really familiar with granular synthesis, um, it's a new term. But don't worry, I will explain it in a much easier term. So what windowing does is it's basically creating the fade in and the fade out at the beginning and the end of the each grain. So when the playback loops back, 
um, there's no jump between the end value and the beginning value of each grain because normally those jump in value creates a nasty click and we don't really want that. So in order to do this, what you need to do is you basically convert the indexing signal and then turn that into a nice rounded curve. And if you're good with the trigonometry, you can probably do it yourself, but uh, some of us probably won't. So what we do is we're going to take a little abstraction from the original, which is called the gen window, which is on the top left corner. And what it does is it takes the playback signal and then does a little fancy math, which looks like this inside. So let's copy this and then paste it back into our tutorial patch. And take it near the phaser, plug the phaser output in and let's create another send. Let's call it window. Connect the inlet to outlet and then you go down to the output of the sample and let's put down another multiply and then create receive and call it the window. Then we do this for the another channel as well. So same thing, make multiply object and then duplicate what you already made, move it closer, plug it in, make it a little bit neater and there you have it. Now your live looper sounds like a glitch effect. So let's go back to the parent window and do the final check before we wrap this up. So that's it. Well, thank you for watching. And so sorry it took me ages to get this video up. I will be a bit more consistent from here on. So we'll be back soon with the final episode, I think, of the PGL very, very soon. And if you have any questions, please leave a comment. Otherwise, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And until next time, Stay tuned and happy patching. See you soon. Bye.